All right, now we're going to get into a field where only the brave get. And this is on the calculation and determination of strain past the yield point, the plastic strains. We have seen already how to calculate elastic strains. Usually, in order to calculate an elastic strain, we recall the stiffness matrix or the compliant matrix, depending on which one you're calculating. If I want strains as a function of stresses, I can use the compliance matrix and tell you what is the strain for a given action or stress. Alternatively, I can write the same equation with initial notation, where this is going to look something like this. We're going to start using now a little bit more initial notation, so I'm going to change, make the change uh, now. But it is the same equation. And in summary, if, uh, for example, we wanted to calculate an incremental elastic strain, since sigma, uh, since uh, d is going to be a constant, then an increment of elastic strain epsilon ij is going to be equal to the stiffness, elastic stiffness matrix times an increment of the stress sigma mn. We have already seen how to do this for isotropic solids and also for anisotropic solids. All right, in order to calculate plastic strains, the procedure is going to be similar, but we're going to have to get a new matrix in order to calculate these plastic uh, deformations. And the plastic deformation, we're gonna add a superscript P, and we're going to see how to calculate that as a function of an incremental change of stress. Notice that in problems of plasticity, we have permanent deformations. So it's important we, that we talk in terms of increments because a path may alter the result. It's not like in elasticity that there is a unique relationship between stress and strain. Okay, so let's start it with the theory that we're going to need in order to uh, calculate these plastic strains. Uh, I'm going to base the theory that I'm going to explain uh, in the following uh, uh, discussion to, I'm going to constrain this to small strain and we're going to use also the small strain uh, strain tensor. We're also going to assume that we have a continuous strain field. Notice that, for example, if you were to have a fracture and a separation between surfaces, uh, that needs some additional analysis. And we're also going to consider that these are strain rate independent processes. Let me add that just to clarify. So we're not going to take into account, in this case, a viscoelastic response. All right. With these three assumptions, then I can further describe the five pillars that I'm going to need in order to develop my plastic theory. The first one is going to be to obtain a yield criterion. A yield criterion is going to tell me when a given state of stress has reached the yield surface. And it's going to be an equation, that which is a function of the stresses, and uh, it, that's going to be equal to a constant. Remember that for isotropy, we don't care about the direction of the principal stresses, but just about the strain tensor. Second, I'm going to need what is called a strain hardening rule. The strain hardening rule is going to tell me how 
this yield stress changes, let's assume a function f star different from f, as a function of the plastic strain. Uh, for example, some rocks, when, uh, when you decrease the porosity and you get them more and more uh, compacted, they get stronger. So that's going to be captured through this equation over here. Three, I'm going to assume that I can decompose the strains so that a given strain tensor can be computed as the summation of the elastic component plus the plastic component. So here I'm going to have the elastoplastic strain, which is going to be a summation of these uh, two processes. Four, I'm going uh, to need what is called a plastic flow rule. And a plastic flow rule will allow me to link the plastic strains with the change of stresses. So here the change of plastic strain is going to be linked to the change of stress. And fifth and last, I'm going to need what is called a, an elastic unloading criterion. And usually what we do in, um, in this fifth uh, assumption is to assume that the, usually the, the elastic, uh, that you can have an elastic rebound uh, when you do unloading. All right, so let's see how this applies to a case that uh, we use very often in geomechanics, uh, which is the more Coulomb criterion. All right, so in more Coulomb, what uh, we have is an equation that uh, links the maximum shear stress to the cohesive strength and the effective normal stress through the friction coefficient, where mu is equal to the tangent of the friction angle. Alternatively, we can write the same equation in the space of principal stresses as sigma 1 equal to uc, usually we use ucs, but in this case let me use uci instead of talking about strength, I'm going to talk about yield. There's a small difference there. And uh, strength, I, will, I mean the ultimate strain of the rock, yield, I mean when the rock starts to develop plastic strains. But it is a very similar equation in which we have two constants and the principal stresses uh, depend on that. And remember that you can calculate uh, either this constant as a function of the cohesive strength and the friction coefficient also is a function of the parameter Q. Actually, this parameter Q is equal to one plus the sine of the friction angle divided one minus the sine of the friction angle. All right, so let's plot this equation in the principal stress space and let's see how we can use it to understand what plastic strains are. This is going to look like this where this is the this is sigma 1 this is sigma 3 this is the maximum limit the slope is q and the intercept at the origin is uci so basically 
this equation that I have over here. Okay, let's try to understand how a bacteria would fail with this uh, more Coulomb uh, criterion. Uh, notice that under these conditions, the maximum principal stress is going to depend on the least principal stress. In three dimensions, this is going to look more or less like this. If I have a block and I load this block, let me change colors here, with, I was meaning to change colors, okay, with sigma 1, this type of uh, yield criterion tells me that the failure is going to depend on sigma 3. And not only tells me what is the maximum value of sigma 1, but also tells me what is going to be the failure surface, which in this case is going to be more or less like this. It's going to be a plane which is at an angle beta, where beta is equal to 45 degrees plus the friction angle divided by 2. This is something that we have seen in previous lectures. And also, very importantly, this plane, when it intersects with the plane where the maximum stress is applied, this line is going to be perpendicular to the least principal stress. Always this plane is going to have that geometrical condition with respect to sigma 3, because that's a configuration of least amount of energy spent as this block slides if it were to fail with respect to each other. Also, this type of failure criterion tells me that it is independent of sigma 2, where sigma 2, notice that it is contained on the ideal failure plane. In this case, sigma 1 is larger than sigma 2 and is larger than sigma 3. So, hopefully you can see that in this case also the intermediate stress doesn't play any role on decomposing its stress on the plane of the failure. And when, in this case, the hanging wall moves down, it's going to move doing work against sigma 3 and not against sigma 2 because sigma 3 is lower and uh, is just more energetically favorable. Okay, so with this knowledge, then now we, we can go ahead and uh, we, we can understand a little bit better the plastic strains. And in order to do that, let me use uh, here a, a blue color this line is also going to tell me about the plastic strains. Notice that when this block, in this case the hanging wall, moves down, it's not going to move in direction 2. It will move in a combination of direction 1 and 3. And in the plot of principal stresses, that's quantified by the normal vector to the yield surface, where decomposing that normal vector on the yield surface is going to tell me what the components of the plastic strains are. Uh, for example, in this case, I would have a component of the plastic strain in direction 3, and in this case, I will have a component of the plastic strain in direction 1. And this block 
is going to move as a combination of a displacement in direction 1 and 3. And you can see also that in this plot, uh, sigma 2, it doesn't play any role, so there is no decomposition of the normal vector on the direction 2. And that's linked to the physical mechanism that we see over here. All right, so let's try to capture this vector n mathematically, and you will see that it is a little bit better to analyze it that way. In order to do that, let me change this equation slightly and write this equation as uh, sigma 1 minus uci minus q times sigma 3. So basically, when I have failure, then the yield criterion is going to be equal to 0. From here, by geometry, I can calculate that the normal vector to this surface is going to depend on this function and is going to be equal to the derivative of the function f with respect to sigma 1, derivative of f with respect to sigma 2, and derivative of f with respect to sigma 3. And the equation I have on top, it's uh, fairly easy to take the derivatives of a derivative of f with respect to sigma 1 is just going to be 1. Derivative of f with respect to sigma 2, there is no sigma 2, so it's going to be 0. And the derivative of f with respect to sigma 3 is going to be negative q. So this is the vector in three dimensions in the principal stress space, which is going to tell me the components of the vector normal to the surface. And I'm going to use that in order to predict the plastic strains. And this is done through what is known as the flow rule, which also has a physical meaning. But let's first go through the mathematical definition. The flow rule tells me that increments in plastic strain in any direction are going to be equal to a proportionality factor, uh, which is called a hardening parameter, but it's just a constant. I ignore it for now. The most important part of the flow rule is to tell me that those increments of plastic strain are going to be a function of the derivatives of the yield surface with respect to the stress or the strain direction I'm considering. Uh, it will be with respect to the stress in the direction of the strain that I am considering. All right, so let's use this equation in order to calculate those uh, plastic strains and see what they predict uh, for our case that we have over here. The plastic strain, the increment of plastic strain in direction one along the direction 1 is going to be, this is just a constant, and the first derivative is just 1. The increment of plastic strain in direction 2 is going to be my constant times 0, and the increment of plastic strain in direction 3 is going to be the constant times negative q. All right. So let's try to understand what that physically means. This means that if I break this solid with a stress in direction 1, the movement of the block in direction 1 is going to be positive and is going to be aligned with the direction of a stress 1. And that makes sense because if sigma 1 is pushing down, the block should move down because sigma 1 is the largest. Sigma 2, we see that here is 0, so the block, in this case, the, the hanging wall, is not moving in horizontal direction. And the plastic strain in direction 3, I get that is going to be Q times the plastic strain in direction 1, which means that 
it, because it has a negative sign that the motion or displacement is going to be opposed to the stress. And that makes sense, right? Because sigma 3 is going, in this case, from right to left, but the movement of the wall is going to be from left to right. That's why we have a negative sign. From here, I could also calculate what the volumetric strain is. It's the same equations that we have used before. The volumetric uh, plastic strain is going to be equal to the summation of all the strains. And in this case, the common factor is going to be my constant, 1 minus Q. And notice that since Q for a 5 equal to 30 degrees, Q is going to be equal to 3, this is going to be actually a negative value, which means that in this failure process, the volumetric strain is going to be negative or in the geomechanics convention, that means that I'm going to have a dilation. Let's see a plot of that uh, to understand that a little bit better. According to what I have developed so far, I could run a test, a true triaxial test, and measure the strains that develop when I run such a test. And here, usually in this triaxial test, we put strain in the x-axis, we put the maximum stress in the y-axis, and then we see what happens with uh, stress as we increase the strain. Well, let's imagine that we run a test in which we increase strain, num a strain in direction 1, and because the rock is elastic, it goes, uh, the stress increases but it increases just until a limit, which is going to be our yield stress. During this elastic path, I will also observe that the strain in direction number three is going to be a function of the Poisson ratio. So far, I'm just invoking elastic equations that we know, and I didn't write uh, so far, but uh, that's something that, that we have seen before. And we know that the strain in the perpendicular direction to the stress apply is going to be less than the one in the direction in which the stress is applied. Let me add one more thing over, the, over here. I'm going to add the volumetric strain. In an elastic test, when I do a compression in one direction and I keep the stress in the perpendicular direction constant, what I have for the Poisson ratio less than 0.5 is a decrease in volume. Or in geomechanics, that would be a positive volumetric strain, a compaction. And let's say that it increases up to this amount. And in here, let me try to improve here my dash line. Um, in here, I am plotting the volumetric strain as a function of epsilon 1. Okay, uh, well, let me write this. And this is as a function of epsilon 1. So that's why I'm stopping at that point. All right, that's when we get up to the yield stress, and we know how to calculate these volumetric and linear strains based on elasticity. What happens now with plasticity? And let's use the equations that we have developed so far. What these equations are telling me is that when I get to yield stress, and if I am under the conditions of perfect plasticity, the plastic strain in uh, direction one is going to be this segment where the because it's perfect plasticity the stress is not going to increase anymore but I am going to have 
a plastic strain and it's going to be this one uh, let me do a little bit shorter so I don't I don't need to more space on the other direction okay for a given value of the increment of plastic strain in direction one my increase in direction two is going to be zero so I'm not going to, to draw that but what I see over here and assuming that q is more or less equal to three is that the radial strain now is going to be three times what the axial strain is so this is going to be what the Mohr Coulomb criterions predicts as the plastic strain in the radial direction and uh, it predicts a lot more of strain on one direction and a, a dilation than in the other in which I'm still going to go into the direction of the stress and as a result of that too as we have seen in this case the volumetric strain is going to increase and it's going to go from compaction into dilation let me clarify that here this is the elastic path and the one in red is the plastic path and I am assuming here that I have perfect plasticity and that means that my yield stress is not changing as my plastic strains uh, change okay uh, you, you might you might think about this uh, yield criterion that we just uh, developed and, uh, and and it has a flow and that flow is that uh, the dilation that that it uh, predicts is too large and in practical applications uh, that, that's not what we see uh, with real rocks so there is a solution for that let me scroll down to get more space and we'll talk about this so far we have defined this flow rule in which the increments of plastic strain are related to this parameter uh, differential lambda and are related to the vector normal to the yield surface where f remember is the yield surface okay when i do uh, and when I use this equation I do what is called an associated flow rule and what that means is that the flow rule is directly associated to the yield surface And that's what give me the, the plastic strain. However, I could relax or I could modify slightly this equation and write that the plastic strains are going to be a function of the derivative of another function, which is not the yield surface. And in this case, this is what we called a non-associated flow rule or non-associative flow rule because now it does not depend on the yield surface but now the function g is what is called a plastic potential function 
and in order for this to be true of course g function g should be different than function f all right we are adding uh, one more variable in here or one more function but most times uh, that's not uh, completely different from the yield surface uh, for example for the case of the more coulomb criterion we can write a plastic potential uh, function which is very similar to the yield surface but we are just going to change one parameter in order to better predict the plastic strains and that's going to be the friction angle instead of the friction angle now we are going to use what is called a dilation angle a dilation angle c where the dilation angle is usually lower than the friction angle uh, you remember that we just said that the more coulomb criterion usually over predicts dilation it predicts too much dilation uh, in direction three so in order to uh, to reduce that dilation that results because of the significant plastic strain or expansion in direction three what we do is modify the dilation angle or, or the, this parameter uh, so that the predicted dilation uh, is smaller and this is going to, to work as follows uh, with uh, with now with the dilation angle if the dilation angle is larger than zero this is going to indicate a dilation and it's going to be the same case as before and notice that in this case one over sine of psi divided one over I will sign off uh, psi or c as you want to call it. Uh, probably a, a Greek viewer can tell me the right way to call it in Greek. And this is going to be our q, but now in terms of the dilation uh, angle. And if psi is uh, larger than zero, then q is going to be a positive number. And then our plastic strain over here our plastic strain vector is going to indicate dilation always in direction 3. If the dilation angle is equal to 0, then this factor is going to be equal to 1. And what that means is that I'm not going to have any dilation, but also I'm not going to have any contraction. And that's what is called an isochoric case which this means same volume and if uh, just give me one sec okay if uh, the dilation angle is less than zero then we're going to have a contraction and probably you know the the case dilation it's uh, more or less uh, physically obvious why we will have that isochoric and contraction not that much so let me explain these two cases when we can have isochoric plastic deformation and uh, a contraction also plastic uh, deformation all right uh, so far we have developed this uh, theory in terms of the of the friction angle and relating the parameter or the the values of sigma 1 and sigma 3 uh, through this function where q is a function of the friction angle or the dilation angle if i use the non-associative uh, flow rule remember the yield is still the same it's just the plastic strains i want to change 
that are going to change if we have a non-associative uh, flow rule. All right, so I could work in a slightly different space uh, that is going to be related uh, not to the principal stresses, but to the invariants. And it's going to be a little bit easier to explain this concept of the dilation angles in there. So this could be similar to, for example, having a stress space where I have the deviatoric stress in, in the y-axis and the and the least principal stress on the x-axis. And this could also be similar to having Notice that because we're dealing with stress sensitive uh, criteria, my objective is to put in this axis the sensitivity factor. So I could convert that in terms of the first invariant of the stress tensor and notice that this is a deviatoric stress. So I could put that as a function also of the second invariant of the deviatoric stress tensor. And so I could continue this logic and I could write my state of stress in the PQ space. Where P is a parameter that quantifies the mean stress. And it is a function of the first invariant of the stress tensor is actually the first invariant divided by 3. Let me add here the prime just to make it obvious that, that this is a P that belongs to the PQ space. And Q in the y-axis is a function of J2. Let me change these Fs actually because I don't want it to, the, to get confused to what we have been using before. Uh, so uh, let's let's just write entirely the work function. And for this one, this one is actually I1 divided by 3 for effective stresses. Okay, so this yield surface, I'm just going to bring it out into this space. And having a a dilation angle higher than zero means that I have a yield surface which has this type of slope where if I were to take a normal vector to that surface I would have components of the plastic strain that are going to decompose into the plastic strain in direction of the deviatoric loading and plastic strains into the direction of the of the uh, mean stress loading or related to and in this case, it's going to be the volumetric compression, and this is going to be the deviatoric strain. And uh, this is going to be, uh, let, let me actually, uh, I always get confused with, or not confused, but with mix where the subscripts go and where the superscripts go. And this is the plastic strain in the axis of P prime. And this is going to be the plastic strain total. All right, same as we saw for the Mohr Coulomb criterion, uh, whenever I have a dilating material, the plastic strain or the volumetric plastic strain is going to be negative. In this case, it goes to the left, and that means a dilation. So this case is actually the case for which the friction or dilation angle, in this case, is larger than zero. In real materials, I also see that 
the yield surface can extend and can go into a regime in which I don't have a, a dilation or a contraction. And this is a case where the dilation angle is equal to zero. If we take the normal vector to the surface in this location, uh, you see that all the plastic strain is equal to the, let me put it on the other side, all the plastic strain is going to be equal to the deviatoric strain and I have no component in the volumetric axis. So there is no dilation, no contraction because the vector is normal and I don't have any component in this direction. And last, I could have a region in which the vector normal to the surface now has components which are both positive and in the same direction of P and Q. So now in this case, the plastic strain in direction Q and the plastic strain in direction of the compression or the volumetric change, uh, those are positive. And what that means is in this case, I'm going to have a case of contraction when I, I go through the yield surface. And this is going to be the case where the dilation angle is less than zero. So I have contraction, volumetric contraction, when I am at the yield surface. And last thing we're going to do is let's try to imp interpret this uh, physically. As I was telling you before, the dilation regime is more or less uh, easy to understand. This is what happens when you have a very close packing, for example, of a granular medium, and you force that packing to fail in shear. If you were to force this packing to fail in shear, what is going to happen is that this grain is going to have to roll over the adjacent uh, grain and move up and into the direction of the shear stress in order to go over the grain uh, which is next to it. And what this is going to cause is that movement up is going to cause a dilation. Uh, and that's going to be valid as long as the grains do not break, right? That's why the volume is preserved and the porosity is going to increase in this case with this type of dilation. And notice that uh, that's uh, when I'm saying that the, the grains are not going to break, that coincides with this axis because this is telling me that this is a region of low mean stress. And at low mean stress, it's going to be very unlikely that I break the grains because my stresses are not too large. Either P or Q are not that large in order to cause the these grains uh, to break. On the other hand, if I, in a region of high mean stress, and I try to do the same type of failure on the same packing, very tight packing, trying to be sheared, what I could have is that when I apply this stress together with all the high stresses that I already have in the other direction, the result is going to be that I could run into grain crashing. And as, as those grains crash, these smaller pieces of grains that have been crushed are going to run into the pore space 
that before was uh, it was empty now it's going to fill with the small particles that uh, result from the crashing and the result is going to be that I'm going to have a contraction of the pore space because the porosity is going to decrease because I have now smaller particles filling the porosity and this is a case in which I'm going to have a contraction and last in the middle I'm going to have a case in which I'm going to be in the middle and I could have movement without either dilation or contraction this is a little bit more difficult to to explain graphically just with uh, a set of grains but you could imagine for example a failure of a very fine grained uh, rock uh, with uh, a made out of clay in which we have a clean failure line uh, then uh, the material is not going to either uh, dilate or contract as uh, we have a plastic strain all right so now with uh, with this section uh, we finish the introduction to the calculation of plastic strains in which the main thing that we have seen is the flow rule and how that depends on the yield surface or the plastic potential function.